way Tom gets through some of these numbers, you know, um, 60 million. Say it quick enough, it doesn't sound like much, does it? But it's terrific, it's fantastic level of support that's come into the industry just now. Um, the 60 million, of course, being part of 160 million, which has come together for the, uh, the Agritech strategy as a whole. And we should say, of course, that it's not, it's not all new money from government. 30 million of the 60 is actually coming from the Research Council, who clearly recognise uh, the benefit and the importance of focusing on this applied research area, you know, the translation of the knowledge that's been generated within the, the research councils, within academia. And, um, and that's really welcome. So um, we should be uh, grateful for the sums that are coming forward and make best use of them. <coughs> the, um, the really interesting part has already been um, has already been explained, and that's what Tom has gone through. The really dull, boring stuff is this whole application process. But I have to say, it is critically important. You know, there's quite a lot of work that goes into this. I don't need to tell some of you here about the effort that needs to be made to put a successful application together. And getting it wrong in some technicality is not really what anyone wants. You know, the assessors certainly don't want it, our operations team don't want it, and, um, and, and you, of course, don't want to be wasting your time and effort. So the help that can come from the guys in the Bioscience KPN, if any of this gets confusing, is really where to, um, where to look for that extended support. So, the application process. I'm going to whistle through this because all of the slides will be available. Yes, yep. they'll, you'll get them, uh, get them in due course. And you will, of course, have access to the guidance for applicants. Now, the guidance for applicants used to be about 60 or 70 pages. It's now much shorter because it has 60 or 70 hyperlinks to the 60 or 70 pages. Um, I'm being flippant, but please do read the guidance for applicants. There are little bits and pieces that you need to know and understand within all of that. But, to go through this, and I will rattle through it, the point that Tom was making in, with regard to the, uh, each, cat, each of the categories within the, uh, the catalyst, we have, you know, where's the light in the centre? Um, we have the single stage uh, uh, process um, that applies for the early stage uh, feasibility studies and indeed for the late stage feasibility studies. The difference primarily between these two, um, two categories, the feasibility studies, is that in early stage, we recognise that there is a good case to be made for academia to come in and lead some of these proposals. You'll have heard from Tom that we are mainly focused on supporting industry-led projects. Okay? And that's critical when we start dealing with the SAF-IP programme of, of competitions, or indeed the, late, the, the industrial research category or the late stage category. But for the early stage, academics can come in and help industry recognise what the potential is for some of the work that's been uh, undertaken so far. So, that's one point to note. The industrial research category, unlike the feasibility studies, is more akin to a collaborative R&D project. It is a two-stage process that those of you who have been involved with um, Technology Strategy Board competitions will, will recognise. It involves the expression of interest, assessment, effectively to, to, as, a, as a form of triage, to weed out those projects that perhaps aren't quite up to the mark, and then full stage with ongoing assessment and moderation. So a more protracted process, but much higher levels of grant. Typically these projects here in the feasibility studies are 12 months long, and, and perhaps have an overall project cost of about half a million pounds, 150 to 500,000 pounds. We can realistically consider projects going up to three million of overall cost within this industrial research category, okay? It's not to say they all have to be that much, and it doesn't make any difference to us how much they are when it comes to the assessment, so long as value for money is taken into consideration. So, I think that's the, the key message there to, to get through. What we want to do within all of this, again, is similar to some of the SAF IP, we want to understand, is the competition in scope? Well, for the Agritech Catalyst, it's such a broad scope, you've heard examples of what we've had through other competitions, there is no definition, there is no theme to the Catalyst. That said, it has to be relevant to the sustainable intensification of agriculture. Okay? 
we don't necessarily want to see somebody but putting in a proposal for a, I don't know, um, some kind of, uh, I don't know, electric car or something. I don't know. But it, it's got to be relevant to the uh, to the track part. We've got to understand the, uh, the business proposition because that is key to what we're doing. We're all about driving profit to the bottom line of UK PLC. So the business proposition is important. We need to know a bit about who the project partners are. Are they confident? Are they capable? Do they have the capacity? It is explained. And thirdly, why is it that you need support from the public purse? Okay? We're not about grant aiding capital investment to concrete somebody's yard. We're not about putting in a new dairy into a, a, a farm business. Why does the public need to invest in your proposal to take it forward? What is the additionality that comes from that? So, full stage application form has 10 March questions. Um, they have been uh, formulated in discussion with the Research Council and indeed with colleagues in Whitehall. Um, it is used for the second stage of the, uh, the full stage form or for the single stage uh, feasibility studies. Um, the expression of interest form for the industrial research category, as I say, it's a bit of a triage and it has a reduced number of, number of questions. Okay. But nonetheless, all of this will be explained within the, the application process. Um, the areas that we're really looking to, to try and tackle, given that the agritech strategy is focused primarily on pre-farm gate productivity. Okay? Of course there is pool from the post-farm gate, the processing environment, but it is, it is largely about agritech and primary production. Now those involved with food processing and manufacturing, indeed food and drink processing and manufacturing, will cry, hang on a minute, you know, this is, this is just not fair. Why aren't we being allowed to put in applications for this post-farm gate area? Um, we have to start somewhere. Actually, although these big numbers I mentioned are, um, are significant, the focus was on primary production. The area of post-farm gate processing manufacturing certainly has a case to make with regard to ongoing support, but just now, rather than diluting the money that's available across the entire food chain, it has been focused on this primary production area. So, effectively, everything you can think of that relates to crop or livestock production, including horticulture, including aquaculture, including non-food crops, and including ornamentals, okay? The ornamentals is a new addition that isn't uh, uh, available as an option within the, uh, the Sustainable Agri Food Innovation Platform. So that is embraced within this particular category here. So, each of these questions, I'm not going to go through them. You will see that in the, uh, the guide for applicants that they all exist. Um, clearly, the emphasis is on the top line there, um, the business proposition. We need to know and understand about, uh, about that. Uh, we need to know uh, what it is that's um, uh, likely to come forward in terms of the commercialization potential for what's going through. Understanding if you've got freedom to operate, these can be issues that you need to resolve before putting in a, an application because it really does get a little bit antagonistic if we get to the point of making an award and find that you're not actually allowed, you don't have a license to operate. Um, the details, of course, is what we want to know and understand. Um, at this stage, uh, can I just ask how many people were involved in applications to, the, to round one, first of all, the catalyst? A few, one or two? How many people put in feasibility study applications? One. You had quite a lot of writing to do, didn't you? Yes. How long was your application, roughly? A couple of dozen pages? Yeah. <laughs> Way too much. There was a little glitch. <laughs> Instead of saying that there should be four pages or five pages available for the whole application, it went through that four or five pages were allowed per question. <laughs> so, so people had quite a lot. It meant that the assessors had a lot of work to do and it meant that we knew quite a lot about individual projects. <laughs> but we're going to refine that so you won't have as much work to do, uh, hopefully, with regard to um, feasibility studies going forward. Um, and the funding and added value, I've made the point that you need to really make the case why you need to get support from the, um, uh, from the public purse, 
um, uh, the situation that you've got uh, personally within your own organisation, the resources you have available, and, and that you are in a position to actually deliver on all this. The last thing we want to do is drive people um, you know, into trouble with, the, with their own banks by getting uh, uh, into difficulty by meeting their obligation for the overall cost. Um, okay, collaboration. Um, it is still, like the SAF IP, a collaborative call. That means we have to have at least two partners. We don't want any one partner to be uh, undertaking more than so I'm getting ahead, more than 70% uh, uh, of the of, of the work associated. Otherwise, it does get to the point where we question whether or not collaboration is truly uh, taking place. Um, this issue about wishing to collaborate and not claim grant is something that is um, has been a question in our mind through the through operations for some time, certainly with regards to uh, uh, the SAP IP. But let's just say that um, what we want to understand is that the uh, collaboration is happening, that the person that's not claiming grant is not doing so and simply pay, paying the other partner who might be an academic, so all the money is going to the academic. Um, we want to perhaps reflect and, and recognise that Treasury will be quite happy to see organisations, larger philanthropic organisations, taking part here, almost making a contribution in kind, if you like. But it's something that I would suggest you simply talk to colleagues in the KTN about before you put things forward, just so that you don't fall foul of any questions over the, uh, the integrity of the collaborative intent, if I can put it that way. So um, just keep that one in mind and talk in a little bit more detail should you uh, wish to go through. Um, many pages and many appendices uh, in one feasibility study at the front, at the front here. Um, a lot of you will have seen this uh, slide before. We want our assessors to see questions answered in a fairly concise way. We don't want to see and require uh, assessors to have to go to um, uh, internet links to read about the background associated with uh, the, the, the proposals in general. The right amount of information we're trying to get to, so apologies for the first time round. Um, and the quantification and justification for what it is that you're going to do. The impact and value for money is something that the assessors will be looking at. If it's a £3 million proposal, justify that level of expenditure. If it's a £150,000 expenditure, convince the assessors that you can do it for that amount of money. Okay? Sometimes applications come in with too little in terms of overall cost and the assessors just don't believe it can be done. So get things right. Um, leaps of faith here, going from one work package to the other, miracles occurring, that's something that the assessors will um, probably question and downscore the overall application as a, as a result. Gateway, okay, let's just take it that in this situation, so long as you're dealing with agriculture, primary production, no one's going to have things chucked in the bin. But if you are on something silly, you know, a, a new computer game or something for farmers, then that's probably not going to be, actually, it might actually be some stimulus, that, and that might work. But anyway, um, uh, we're unlikely to see too many going into the bin as a result. All of these costs, let's just put these up, you can all read, I'm not going to go through them uh, individually, but um, with regards to capital equipment here, um, it is eligible, but I've had a number of uh, people phoning up saying, right, I'm going to need to buy a new tractor, I'm going to need to put in a new dairy parlour, you know, can I claim grant on that whole lot within the scope of the competition? Well, you can claim the proportion of the depreciation that's associated with that capital investment over the life of the project, but you're not going to get grant on a half million pound parlour and get it all written off within the course of the 12-month feasibility study. Sorry. This is not the days of the old FHDS grant scheme, for those of you that are old enough to remember that. So, remember, it's the proportion of the cost and it's the proportion of the depreciation that's associated. Um, Subcontracts are there, that's all fine. Eligible and ineligible costs with regard to overheads, it's fine, but clearly corporate hostility is not, uh, is not really something that we want to encourage uh, within the, the, the cost structure. Um, protecting your IP, 
um, we want you to uh, protect your IP and we want you to um, exploit your IP. But these costs are not, um, are not eligible as part of the process. Some of the things that are not uh, eligible here, uh, higher purchase interest, you know, the fact that you have to go to the bank and get, um, for the, the industry partners here, and get funding for this, these costs are not associated because clearly it's, um, it's your own business arrangements that take that into consideration. Um, uh, the value of existing assets that you've got, such as uh, intellectual property rights, um, data software and so on, that's, that's not something that's going to come through. And although we have a, uh, a requirement for you to, to audit some of your expenditure on first claims, on last claims, claims and, and throughout the, the process should the monitoring officer require investigation, we expect you to have the information available and, and paying you to provide that is not something that's going to come into play. Um, academic partners, well, again, the, the, the issue here um, is just to recognise that when academic partners put in their costs on the, uh, the application form, the costs they put down are the eligible cost based on the full economic calculations. So universities, academic institutions will take their 100% costs and have to reduce that to 80% for reasons best known to people in the research councils and academia, which I'm sure they can explain later. The 20% difference should not appear anywhere on your application form, okay? It is the 80% number that the academic needs to put on the application form. That's all I'm going to say there. Talk to us later if you want to go into it in more detail. The collaboration agreement, let's just say, if you're getting into bed with somebody in a business sense, we want to know that you have got the terms of reference sorted out. We're not going to prescribe those terms of reference. We simply want to know that you have come to some agreement. And people that monitor this before the project kicks off will make sure you have something signed to say I agree to share the profits with Jonathan Snape, 50%, 50-50, okay? From all projects, he's got that deal with us. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, that process just needs to be put in place, okay? Equally, you need to be in the situation of having an exploitation plan put together, and monitoring officers will want to know that the exploitation plan is in place. The last thing I'll say before I shut up is that with regard to collaboration agreements, are there any lawyers in the room? <laughs> no. When they get their hands on collaboration agreements, particularly the large corporate lawyers that are working for the multiples, they start going through things with a fine tooth code. So start thinking about that collaboration agreement early in the stage, whether you're successful or not in the applications before you here, just make sure that the respective lawyers in the partnership are talking to each other, because it can take a long time to get things buttoned. So that's all the boring stuff. Read the guides for applicants, please. There's one for each of the three categories. Um, and, and speak to the colleagues in the KPN who are, who are well versed in all of this and, and more than willing to help. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>